You may have seen this graph or a graph very similar to it circulating on the internet. This graph is from Steven Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. And like a great many famous graphs that you see circulating on the internet, it is a misuse of statistics. The biggest issue is that it presents statistics as equivalent, which are not equivalent. If we look at the top, we see Crow Creek, South Dakota. This is specifically referring to the Crow Creek Massacre. At the bottom of the graph, this is being compared to Europe and US of the 20th century. This is a disingenuous comparison because it takes a single data point, which references a single day within a single community, and comparing this to potentially thousands of data points, which reference a century across multiple continents. Now, you should hopefully see intuitively why this is a problem, but just in case, let me elaborate. Record keeping in Europe and North America in the 20th century was pretty good. If there's one thing bureaucracy is good at, it's keeping records. As a consequence of this, we have a very accurate record of how many people died and how throughout the 20th century. We've got so much data that we are able to compile a statistic like this with a high degree of accuracy. It's not going to be off by more than half a percent or so. Archaeologically, our records of this kind are abysmal. Not everything that existed is preserved, and not everything that is preserved is found. Pinker's graph itself demonstrates the severe limitations of the data set. For the top block, referencing prehistoric archaeological sites, he averages 21 data sets. In the legend, some of these data sets are described as coming from multiple sites, so if we put all of that together, we have 78 sites. These sites encompass a time span of a little over 15,000 years. Or, to put it another way, we have on average 0.0052 data points per year. Or, to put it another way, half a data point per century. This is being compared against modern bureaucracy. I want to talk a little bit about constructing statistics using inadequate data sets. When your statistics include a great many data sets, any outliers are going to be blended in with the masses. With an inadequate data set, any dramatic outliers are going to dramatically influence the end result. Thus, the statistician working with an inadequate data set has to be careful about which data points are included in his statistical analysis. I want to demonstrate this by way of everybody's favorite educational device, a math experiment. In our thought experiment, we are a statistician who is conducting a health survey. We want to know the average weight for Canadian males of 5 foot 8 in height. So the most obvious solution, we just weigh everybody in our target demographic and we compile the results and we get an end result of something like 187 pounds. This is the best case scenario where we've got a large enough sample size to compile reliable statistics. Let's run the simulation again. This time we only get 10 applicants for our study. These applicants range from 130, which is scrawny but not freakishly scrawny, all the way up to 220, which is a bit chunky but not unreasonably so. The upper and lower limits of what is sort of normal. The others occupy 10 pound intervals in between. The average in this case works out to 175, which is not the real number but it's in the same ballpark as the real number. Suddenly a new subject comes in at the last minute, and his number is 1400. If we include him in the study, it pushes the average up to 286. Not only is this dramatically higher than the real number, but it also fails to represent any given participant. It's significantly higher than 92% of the participants and significantly lower than 8% of the participants. When you're working from very limited data points, it's tempting to include every data point you can find. But this mentality is a false friend, as significant outliers are going to have a disproportionate impact on a small data set. Now if we return to the Pinker graph, do we see anything here that looks like an outlier? There's another issue with small data sets, this time related to archaeology. In our previous thought experiment, we had 10 data points, each within the normal range, separated by 10 pound intervals. More realistically, if we were to take 10 Canadian citizens at random, we'd probably end up with a data set that looks something like this. The average person is naturally going to gravitate towards the average, and the odds of getting a significant outlier are going to be slim. Archaeology, however, does not provide us with a random sample. There are significant biases with regards to archaeological preservation as well as archaeological discovery. Not all things are preserved equally, not all things are discovered proportionally. Let's imagine a group of nomadic hunter-gatherers. One of the old people in this group dies of old age, so you bury him relatively close by. You move on a week or two later. Two months later, somebody else dies in this new site, so you bury him, and a week or so later, you move on to another site. What are the odds that an archaeologist is going to find these isolated graves? A human body in a crouched burial is a small thing, only a meter by a meter. The woods of North Ontario are a very big thing. 
An archaeologist could spend his whole life out there digging test pits at random and never turn up anything. So, what sort of grave do you think is most likely to be uncovered? Archaeology is biased in favor of sites where a lot of people died in a very short amount of time. I'm not well enough versed in taphonomy to give more than a simple explanation of taphonomic bias. You bury a page of paper in the ground, come back ten years later, what are the odds that that paper is still going to be intact? Compare that to, what are the odds of, if you bury war and peace in the ground, come back ten years later, that some pages will still be intact? Larger concentrations have a better chance of preservation. Once again, archaeology is disproportionately more likely to dig up massacre sites than individual graves. So, archaeological and taphonomic bias are going to ensure that a disproportionate number of your data points are going to represent outliers. And at the same time, your small sample size is going to prevent you from blending those outliers into your statistical analysis. Taking this back to the original issue of comparing two incomparable data sets, a common criticism that is often leveled against Pinker's work runs something like this. How can you say the 20th century is the least violent century in history? We had two world wars, the Holocaust, and multiple other genocides. To which Pinker responds, you have to look at things in their entirety. Yes, the world wars were terrible, but compared to the whole of the 20th century, they're insignificant. Now, I disagree with the sentiment, but let's pursue this argument on Pinker's own terms. If, as Pinker argues, the Holocaust has to be taken in the context of 20th century Europe as a whole, why then is the Crow Creek Massacre not worthy of the same consideration? If the Holocaust is not allowed to be presented in isolate, why do you present the Crow Creek Massacre in isolate? I would like to take a moment to talk about my motivations in producing this criticism. The obvious defense against my criticism would be to say, you're picking apart one line in this graph which contains many lines. Pinker himself, within the text of Better Angels, tempers the graph, stating something to the effect that his arguments here are not conclusive. Here are my stronger arguments. He then goes on to present some stronger arguments, but with a much more limited scope. I have a couple of counter-arguments. If this graph is not up to snuff, why include it in the book? If it's not up to snuff, why lead with it and keep the stronger arguments in reserve? The explanation is clearly the same reason why Crow Creek is in there despite its inadequacy. Pinker understands the power of the graph in rhetoric. And herein lies the reason why I wanted to produce this criticism of this graph. Graphs like this are an extremely powerful, mimetic, and broad-reaching rhetorical device. Their reach is far greater than the original work to which they were attached. Better Angels of Our Nature is over 800 pages long. It's a tedious read and it costs 30 bucks. An argument in this form has limited appeal among the general audience. This graph, on the other hand, can be shared in a Facebook post and takes 30 seconds to digest. I've seen this graph and a number of graphs very similar to it pop up time and again on the internet, always with Crow Creek as their crowning jewel. This brings me to my specific focus on the Crow Creek data point. The Crow Creek data point is key to the visual impression of this graph. The visual impression is the strongest rhetorical device of the graph. It's also the most famous of the prehistoric data points that are presented, which means it is the most influential in the public conversation, and also the easiest for me personally to research and poke holes in. This graph, specifically because of its flaws, harnesses a great deal of rhetorical power. That amount of power should not go unquestioned if the work is as fundamentally flawed as this one. Having hopefully explained myself, I would like to return to why the comparison in this graph is disingenuous. To put it simply, the Crow Creek Massacre was, first and foremost, a massacre. What exactly is he trying to say by comparing a massacre to generalized mortality statistics over a hundred years? Well, duh, a massacre is going to perform badly in that comparison. That's what a massacre is. It's a terrible, terrible thing. Let me give a simile, returning to our health survey statistician. He wants to answer the research question, what's more likely to kill you, a diet consisting entirely of apples or a diet consisting entirely of pears? This is a valid research question. It is not a valid research question to ask, what's more likely to kill you, a diet consisting entirely of apples or a diet consisting entirely of cyanide? One's food, the other's poison. You knew the answer going in. Both apples and pears contain cyanide. It makes up a very small part of their composition. It's disingenuous to present cyanide as the whole of the pear. The Crow Creek Massacre was not a general mortality statistic for violence over the span of a hundred years across a continent. It was a massacre. Now, if you wanted to use massacres as a data point to construct an argument about violence over time, 
You would not use the mortality rate of the massacres, which is determined primarily by luck. What you would use is the incidence rate. How frequently did massacres occur in this society? But of course, we don't have sufficient archaeological evidence to make a comparison of this kind. Let's talk about another methodological issue, once again relating to Crow Creek taken as an isolate. I want to draw a comparison between Crow Creek and the Bacherin Massacre. In 1708, the forces of Peter the Great laid siege to Bacherin and massacred the inhabitants. At the time, the town was estimated to have a population of about 20,000. It's estimated that about 15,000 people were killed. Don't quote me on this, by the way. I'm not well enough versed in Ukrainian history to interrogate the numbers that Google provided. I'm bringing this up to make a methodological point, not a historical one. So, according to the information I have, approximately three-quarters of the population of Bacherin was massacred. Crow Creek had an estimated population of about 750, and approximately 500 people were killed, or about two-thirds of the total population. So, let's make the comparison in a couple of different ways. According to raw numbers, Bacherin was 30 times as bad as Crow Creek. According to percentage of community population lost, Bacherin was slightly worse than Crow Creek. Using the Pinker model, Crow Creek was 60 times worse than Bacherin, because the Pinker model takes Crow Creek as an isolate and takes Bacherin as part of the Ukrainian state. Ukraine at the time had a population of about 1.5 million, meaning that the massacre represented about 1% of the total population. So despite being significantly worse in terms of raw numbers, and despite being slightly worse in terms of community damage, this model presents Bacherin as being a mere 60th as bad as Crow Creek. This is another piece of rhetorical and statistical trickery. The more communities are included in your demographic statistic, the lower the impact of any violence is going to be in the graph. Let me demonstrate this by presenting another hypothetical. We don't know who the victims of the Crow Creek massacre were, they could be one of the several groups which occupied the region at the time of contact, or they could have been another group we don't know about. The Pinker model assumes that the Crow Creek people were an isolated nationality consisting of a single village. If this were the case, it would be a very rare thing indeed. You don't make a village in the territory of strangers, you make a village in the territory of your kinsmen. Let's correct this error in the most modest possible fashion. Let's say that the nation of the Crow Creek people occupied two villages. Let's say that the other village had the same population as the Crow Creek village. Unsurprisingly, this is going to have a dramatic impact on the shape of our graph, cutting it down from 60 to 30. We don't know what nation the Crow Creek people belonged to, we don't know how many villages that nation had, and we don't know their overall population. Until we know all of that, you cannot use Crow Creek in the way Pinker would like to. That is not how statistics work. We do not have sufficient evidence to make this comparison. We simply do not get to know the answer to questions like these. We can look at the evidence and come up with one of several educated guesses, but that's all that's ever going to be is a guess. Comparing apples to cyanide is not going to help you. This is not how statistics work.